بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace and mercy of Allah be upon us upon the Muslim Ummah upon all human beings the depressed humanity at large. Dear brothers and sisters, today is a solemn occasion for us. We apologize for the inconvenience. The seat is limited and the time at our command is limited. My duty is to introduce Brother Didath. It is for easy for me. The media has done the job for me long before. He is familiar with the brothers all around the world, the brothers in Kuwait, through the media. You have heard him speaking with Swagat. You have seen him in dialogues with so many prominent Christian priests and learned scholars. So my duty is simply to say the speaker of this night is Brother Didat. And the subject, Islam and Christianity. Islam is a universal message. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jesus and all the prophets are prophets of Allah. They are sent to humanity to guide them, to show them the right path. We accept the universal message of Allah. We respect all the prophets of Allah. But Islam has one special claim. The only message preserved in its original form is the message of Islam, is the holy book of Allah, Quran. It is our duty to transmit this, to broadcast this message to the world at large. For the last so many years, we were not fulfilling our duty to the expectation or to the necessity. We are picking up, we are doing something now. And I hope Brother Dida's program will herald a new era of dawa, active dawa among, among non-Muslims in this country. My dear brothers, the topic is here, the speaker is here, he will he will make his speech. This meeting and the so many meetings of last week he, 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 that were conducted here in Kuwait was under the sponsorship of his International Islamic Charitable Foundation. This foundation, this International Islamic Char Charitable Foundation is, belongs to Muslim Ummah. It is the power property of Muslim Ummah, not for a country. It is not meant for Kuwait only. It is meant for the Muslim Ummah, even in the, in the remotest corners of Africa. Muslims are backward in so many respects. In education and science, in industry and progress, in, so, in all fields, even in Dawa, they are backward. International Islamic Charitable Foundations wants to, to them bring up, to make, give them push, to make them capable of de <coughs> doing their job. It is in the beginning stage, by the grace of Allah, it is picking up. You must approach the International Islamic Charitable Foundation in such a manner that it is your, or your foundation. You must consider it your foundation and you must use it in applying your capabilities to the benefit of Muslim Ummah at large. My dear brothers, here we have limitation of our time. After his speech there will be a question answers time. The time will be very limited. I am very sorry to tell you no question will be allowed from the floor. Questions will be asked from the floor, from, from the mic, from the floor. 
No, it will be... So we cannot uh, steal this. Why, uh, they will still be write it down. No, no, no. This is the trouble, you see. The, any coward can write anything. Let the man come forward and ask his questions. We know who's asking the question. Because the munafiks, you know, they can send questions here and it has been happening. The munafiks send questions and they are not there. I'm answering the question unnecessarily, not knowing who the guy is responsible. If there are men enough, they must come forward and ask the question. Considering the opinion of Brother Didat, we want to ask the question from the floor, but one restraint, one li we, we must keep necessary questions, useful questions that may enlighten us, that will give us more knowledge, more light. Such questions should be asked. Silly questions, emotional questions, please prevent and cooperate with us conducting this program in a nice, decent, dignified manner. With these few words, I request Brother Didat to deliver his speech. He will be speaking on Islam and Christianity. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم أن لا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله فإن تولوا فكل شهدوا بأننا مسلمون صدق الله صدق الله المرزيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters I was a little worried, not knowing where to start. I'm having a bit of a hectic time. There's no peace. In love, people come along, they want to phone me, they want to talk to me, they want to interview me, newspapers, magazines, and it is quite a hectic time I'm having, uh, more especially at this age of 71. It does tell on a person. And your climate also, from extreme warmth, to extreme cold and again back into extreme warmer and again to extreme cold. It has affected me for the first time. You know, in all my travels, I was never so affected by this weather as here now. But Alhamdulillah, I'm fit enough to stand before you. I was wondering how to start, what to start with. And Alhamdulillah, Awaqari, the first time I see him in my life was here. He shook hands with me and he sat down. And he started his Qiraat from Surah Ali Imran. Ali Imran, chapter 3, he started from verse 59. Inna mathala Isa, inna Allahi ka mathali Adama, khalaqahu min turabin, thumma qala lahu kun faikun. That's what he started with. And the ayah I read to you at the beginning is ayah 63. It's a part of that, as if he was telling me, look, Mr. Didat, start with this, talk this. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I think he opened the doorway for me, you know. Allah bari ta'ala does it, he opens the doorways for you. So, in Ayah 63, Surah Ali Imran, I was explaining to you, my brothers and sisters, at the first meeting, that if you have a translation like the one I'm showing, I'm carrying around with me, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, I said, very, very easy to find any reference in the Quran. At the back is an index. So as soon as he started to read, Inna masala Isa, Inna Allahi ka masali Adama, I said, now where is that? Where is it? I know it's in the Quran. He's reading the Quran. There's no doubt about that. But where is it? So quickly, I opened up Jesus in the Quran. Isa, Jesus. I opened it in the Quran, and under J, one of the headings under Jesus is like Adam. Like Adam. So, like Adam, it says chapter 3, verse 59. Very easy, I checked it up. Now, while reading, I said, yes, 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 it's a continuation. I seem to know the ayahs. Numbers are hard to remember. But where is it? You know it's there, but where is it? Index. Index. Shh. So easy, Wallah, so easy. And more especially for my non-Arab brethren. I said, look, you owe it to yourself to get this translation. And they are made available for you, outside. Get them. And they are very cheap. It's a wrong term. It's very inexpensive, rather. Very inexpensive. Here in your country, you know, I don't know how you fling your money. 
but five dinar each for 2,000 pages, an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages with Arabic text, translation and commentary for five dinars. Of course, if you were in my country, you will get it for one dinar in my country. I'm giving it to people for one dinar. There's about four rands in my currency, but we, five, five rands. There's a little, say, four and a quarter, one and a quarter dinar. You get this. But unfortunately, we have to ship this by air. It has to be airlifted. It, they were airlifted here to your country, and for five dinars, you'll have to agree, it is very, very inexpensive. You owe it to yourself to get it. Now, Allah Ta'ala tells us in this ayah, Qul, he's telling our Nabi to say, he's telling us to say, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And the basis of getting together See, each and every one who wants to have a round table conference, they want to have their own agenda, the way they want it, they make certain preconditions. And most of the time, almost all the time, unreasonable conditions, unjust conditions, people make out. Like, we want to now talk with the Jews. Now, previously the Jews says, I want to talk. We said, no, we don't talk with you. Now we said, all right, we are prepared to talk. Now the guy says, no, he doesn't want to talk. He says, you, you, your intentions are not right, as if he's reading your mind. So the Jew, you know, how he's making preconditions, he wants to tie you up beforehand, before you open your mouth. Now Allah Bari Ta'ala, he doesn't play games like that. Very, very fair. The fairest propositions that anybody can ever put, one religious group can put to another religious group, is given here. Number one. Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but Allah there is but one God call him by any name that one and only being we must worship that's the first proposition let's get, to, get together common platform and let us discuss this in principle everyone will agree with us the Hindu will agree with you the Christian will agree with you the Jew will agree with you. Nobody can disagree. Let us worship the one and only God that there is. We say, call him by any name. Allah says in the Quran, call him by any name. Except those names which are contaminated. Don't call him by a name which is contaminated. For example, if one said the name of God Almighty is Rama, People from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, they know this name, Rama. Is a god of my Hindu ancestors, Rama. A human god, incarnation of God, they believe, that God came down to earth as a man, in the form of Rama, seventh incarnation of God, seventh time that God came into the world, he came as Rama, Krishna was the eighth incarnation of God, Buddha was the ninth incarnation of God, this is the Hindu philosophy. But they say there is one God. We agreed. We must worship the one and only God. But at the back of his mind, he says, who is this God? He says, Rama. Now, when you say Rama, if you read the Ramayana, the Hindu epic, Ramayana, then you know that this man Rama was a prince of Ayodhya, a kingdom in central India. He had a wife called Sita. He had a brother called, L called Lakshman. And his wife was abducted by a fellow called Ravana from Ceylon. All the whole picture, if you know. So, ah, yes, yes, yes. So that is your God. Now that term is contaminated because it conjures up other mental pictures. You say the name is Krishna. So, ah, yes, 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 I know Krishna. If you know his history. If his, his name is Muhammad, the name of God Almighty is Muhammad. So, ah, yes, 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 that camel driver. You know, he was born in Mecca. His father's name was Abdullah. His mother's name was Amina. And he married a woman called Khadija at the age of 26. And he died at the age of 63. Ah, yes, he's buried in Medina conjures up a mental picture. His name is Jesus Christ. Ah, yes, 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 yes. The child born in the stable to a Jewish girl called Mary, circumcised on the eighth day. You see, conjures up a mental picture. 
Any term, any name that conjures up a mental picture is not befitting the majesty of God. Call him Allah, call him Rahman, call him Rahim, call him Jehovah. In the African languages they give terms, names to God Almighty. Beautiful, Wallah, beautiful. Beautiful names. No mental picture. So any term applied to God Almighty which does not create a mental picture is valid. If it stands for the Supreme Being, our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, it's befitting. So we say, let us worship the one and only true God. And everybody says, yes, but in the concept, we go off. One believes that God comes down to earth as a man. Other one says, look, there's only one man God. The other says, there are many man gods. God becoming men, born to women, women carrying them for nine months and delivering them. And they're dying. Somebody kills them, they die, or they get old and they die. He said, that is not the God we are talking about. Allah na'buda illallah. And Allah bari ta'ala gives us in this book some 99 attributes. His qualities. We know him by his qualities. So if you want to know what the Quran says about God Almighty, again, in the index, go to the index. Go to the index. Under the subject God and the G, you'll find 140 different refer references. Shh. This is a veritable encyclopedia of Islam. Everything so easy, wallah. You know, this man over 50 years ago, he did the job. He died penniless. Abdullah Yusuf Ali died penniless in the streets of London. He died. He made nothing out of this. Since then, hundreds of thousands of Qurans have been published. His Qurans without change. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give him, you know, his blessings for what he had done. He had done a monumental work. He spent 40 years of his life in this work. 40 years. And in his preface he says he's not satisfied. He hopes that somebody better than him might come along and improve it. But I can assure you, my dear brother, I, I can say without any fear of contradiction that till Yawm al Qiyamah there won't be another. Because this life that we are leading now, nobody is prepared to dedicate 40 years of his life for a cause. Another great scholar who did the translation of the Quran, in his preface he says that it took me seven years to do the job. And if I had known that it will take seven years, I wouldn't have started it. See the difference? That if he knew, he thought, I'll finish it in six months. I'll finish it in a year. It's taken two years. And three, and now four, five, six, seven. But he said, if he knew at the start it will take seven years to do the job, he wouldn't have done it. This man spent 40 years and he says, I'm not satisfied. That is the approach, approach to the Quran. So that we worship none but God. In principle, the Christian, since the subject is Christianity in Islam, the Christian agrees with us. He said, yes, no, we agree with you that we should worship the only God that there is. There is only one God. He tells you, he's one God. But what is this one God like? So he says, he's like Jesus. And what is Jesus like? He says, Jesus is like God. You ask any Christian, what is God like? What is he like? He says, he's like Jesus. And what is Jesus, God like? Uh, Jesus like is, is like God and God is like Jesus. So, where is his uniqueness? We all agreed. In principle again, you ask it that God is unique. Unique means there's nothing like him that you can think or imagine. That is God Almighty, the Creator. He's beyond our imagination. The most beautiful mental picture we can create of the Supreme Being is still a figment of our imagination. The most beautiful idea you have of God is like this, is like that, is so handsome. It's all a figment of your imagination and we were not to worship our imagination. So, he says, you see, God Almighty, ah, he came down to earth as a man. God becoming a man. They say, man can't become God. But God can become man. I don't know if you have seen these uh, debates of mine. One with a Palestinian Christian called Anish Rosh in the, uh, in the Royal Albert Hall on the subject, is Jesus God? So he goes on to explain. He said, you see, man can't become God, but God can become man. But if you get the tape, amazing, you know, man... He doesn't know how he's contradicting himself. Himself, At the same time, standing on the same platform, same, 
Same instant he contradicts himself. He said, you see, but God can become man. And to illustrate the point, he gave a beautiful analogy, which is absurd in the extreme, but beautifully put. He said, you see, you see a, a group, a swarm of ants, ants. Namal, Namal, eh? Namal, Namal. Yes, Surah Namal, there's Surah Namal in the Quran. You see, it means the ant. You see a group of ants, and they're not going right. And you want them to correct the, the path. So you push this one, he says, you push this one's nose, you pull this one's tail. He says, no, not this way, this way. And you go that way, and you see it's not working. Because you're a man. It's not working. So, the ant can't become men that you can guide them. But you, he says, suppose you have the power. He's assuming that God, God has the power to become, you have the power to become an ant. So, can you now guide him better? He said, of course. He says, now as, a, as an ant, you can tell the other ants, you know, by signals what to do, what not. So, in other words, that God became man to guide us to the right path. Because as God, he couldn't guide. He had to come down to earth to lead us. But now, how foolish the whole thing is. And he's saying it. But he doesn't see the implication. He says, but you end up as an ant. If you, God Almighty, you are the God, you are man, you become ant, you finish off as an ant. Right. Same logic. God becomes man, he ends up as, as a man. God becomes a man, he ends up as a man. If you become a cockroach or an ant, no man how powerful you are. I have some, I know some powerful friends in, the, in our audience, you know, karate experts. I'm no patch to them. I'm an old man. Besides that, they are trained men. I, was, I also went through a training, but it's 50 year old, that training, they are all sophisticated. I know a couple in the audience. But if they become ants, you know what I can do with them? Just like that. I can crush them. You know that? If he becomes a cockroach, just like that. There's no match to him. Then I can just do it like that. Squeeze, finished. Crush him to pieces. Crush him to pieces. So if God becomes man, same thing you can do to him. You can knock hells into him. And the Christian record shows that the Jews were ever knocking hells into Jesus Christ. Again and again they picked up stones to stone him. Again and again. And he's running, hiding. Towards his end, according to the Christian record, he said that his trial, a soldier punched him in the stomach. He says, come on, prophesy who hit you. Come on. In other words, you know too much, you are a prophet, tell me what's my name. The one who hit you, what's his name? Come on, come on. prophesy who hit you. He says, come on, give me, what's my name? Then they say on the cross, he was lanced on the side with a spear, and water and blood flew out of him. So I said, you see, once you are a human being, you are a human being. You can be treated as a human being. You are not God, you can never be God. God becomes man, he's a man. If you become a donkey, you are a donkey. If you become a dog, you are a dog. You are no longer a human being. The respect that you deserve as a human being is not there for you. You, do, you become a pig, you are a pig. Am I right? Am I right? If you become a pig, I treat you. The Christian will make bacon and ham out of you. Look, this is the only God becoming a man. So, we in Islam, we believe in Jesus Christ as one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We believe. Now, there are certain fundamental differences between Islam and Christianity. Beginning with the origin of man, Adam and Eve. The Christians say that God created Adam and Eve. We say God created Adam and Eve. He put them in the garden. We say he put them in the garden. With certain instructions, we say with certain inst instructions. In details we might differ. In the choice of language, words will differ. But in principle we are agreed. They were told not to eat of a certain tree. We say yes, they were told not to eat of a certain tree. And they act. We say yes, they act. And as such they fell from grace. We say, yes, as such they fell from grace. Now, what? They say, you see, sin entered the world. 
They were kicked out of the garden and the sin that they had committed. Now that sin entered the world. We say sin does not, is not inherited. Sin you acquire. They say no, sin is inherited. Each and every one, they say, has inher inherited the sin of Adam. They call it the original sin, the original first sin. Each and every human being, wherever you are, you have inherited that sin. And that sin, they say, it cannot be rubbed off by individual effort. You can do nothing about it. It's now part of you. So you need somebody. You need somebody to come and die for you. Somebody to wash away, to take that payload, that burden, which you have inherited, he must take it off. And who can do that? One man can't do that. No man can do that. Carrying away the sins of billions. So God Almighty himself has to come down to earth as a man. And he dies as a man on the cross to redeem you of that original sin. Now the Muslims say, no. Adam and Eve, when they were pushed out of the garden, they, they made istighfar, they repented, and Allah forgave them. It's forgiven. Even if they were not forgiven, they were personally responsible for their action. And they had paid a very heavy price. According to the Bible, the heaviest price that they had paid. Number one, they were kicked out of the garden. I'm asking, and you can ask your Christian friends, is that not punishment enough? Look, some children were told not to pluck your mangoes or your bananas or any fruit, and they picked, they stole, they broke it, and they ate it. You chasing them out of the garden and barring them from ever coming into the garden because they had disobeyed you once, is that not enough punishment? So everybody said, no, that's enough punishment. No more. It's too harsh. You can scold them, slap them, and say, look, man, next time, don't pluck these raw mangoes, you know, let them ripen, and I will give you some when the fruits are ripe. I will share them with you. But don't steal, my child, don't steal. But no, 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 no. Here is a permanent bar that says, never to come here again. Then he puts a flaming sword. Flaming sword. There's another tree in the garden, the Bible says. The tree of life. If they add that, they would live forever, like God. And they'll start breeding. There'll be billions. There'll be today five billion gods here. Oh, no, no, no. If nobody died since Adam till now, can you imagine? Nobody died. And they're breeding and we are all breeding away. Huh? There won't be standing room on this earth. You agree? No standing room. Because this tree of life eternal. Once you eat that, you can't die. So and you keep on breeding. <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> you can imagine what would have happened to this good earth of ours. So that tree, they said, no, now if Adam and Eve go and eat that, finish. Finish for God. Because can you imagine now we can become billions and billions and billions and billions. Shh. And he can't kill us. He can't kill us anymore. Because we become immortals. That tree of life. So God put an angel, a cherubim, a cherub with a flaming sword, swirling. Shh, 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 that they couldn't go. This is in the Holy Bible. Then God curses them. He says, you man, from now on, you must eat bread by the sweat of your toil. You must sweat for a living. In the garden, they had a wonderful time, easy life. You see, if they're sitting under a tree and they wanted grapes, it's a grapes, hmm? the bunch is there. You know, you can see this in films, you know, they can make this. Grapes, it's a grapes there. You want pork chops, pork chops is there. What do you want? You want pomegranates? It's there. What do you want? You wish, whatever you wish for, you get. That was the life. They didn't have to dig the soil. They didn't have to plant corn. Nothing, nothing. You do nothing. Whatever you want is there. Now, you must sweat for your bread. We are all sweating for our bread, for our living, as a punishment. As a punishment for what Adam and Eve did. That's what the Bible says. As a curse from now on, you and your children and your children's children must sweat for a living. And you women, you women, he says you must bear children in pain and suffering. Labor, labor pain. 
That's as a punishment for eating that fruit. I'm asking, is that not fun punishment enough? First kicked out, not punishment enough. Can you imagine, he's so sadistic, this God Almighty. He's getting pleasure out of your suffering now. Kick you out, now he must sweat for your bread, now you woman must pain and labor and cry. For what? For what Adam and Eve did. It's still not enough. Still it is not enough, says the Christian. It's not enough. Now every human being on earth must go to hell. Every creature on earth must go to hell because of what Adam and Eve did. Sin is inherited. I says, what is this? How cruel, how sadistic can God be? He is now following his children. Where? They say 6,000 years have gone. For 6,000 years and for eternity, he is going to put people in hell. For a sin that you didn't commit. A crime which you didn't commit. Allah wants to make you to pay for it. I am asking. Let us say, you remember the British conquest of Kuwait. Who was the guy? I haven't asked. But let's say, some general... Smith, you know, was the guy responsible. Some General Smith, he was the guy who conquered this country some hundred years ago. And he exploited, colonized our people. Now, that man's great-grandson, and now when they did that, one of our Rais was murdered, our rulers, was killed by him. And today, some American Englishman comes along, He's wanting a job from this young Rais, who is the great-grandson of that Rais who was murdered by the General Smith. He comes along, he's wanting a job, and you want a man. His expertise, you want him. You ask him, what's your name? He says, Smith. He says, which Smith? He says, you know, my great-grandfather, you know, he's the man who conquered your country. He's the one, you know, who, who conquered it. He says, yes. Hmm. He remembers, he says, yeah, that means his great-grandfather, he killed my great-grandfather. So right, sit down, sit down, sit down. You know, the Arab says, ahlan wa sahlan, mm -hmm, very good, sit down. And he pulls out a knife from his drawer and puts through him, kills him. Life for life, the man is caught, taken to court, is questioned. Why did you kill this man? This man had just come man from overseas. Why did you kill him? So our young Rais, he says, he says, you see, his great-grandfather killed my great-grandfather. Therefore, I killed him. You know they won't hang him for that, the court. They said, this guy needs a psychiatrist. You know, mental doctor. He's, he's a lunatic. This guy is a lunatic. He's not right in his head, because this fellow was not born then. He was not consulted by the General Smith. He wasn't consulted. General Smith didn't consult his grandson. He said, my son, shall I kill this race of the Kuwaitis? He was not consulted. So how can he, you hold that little, this young child, young man responsible? If you did, they say, you are a lunatic. The whole world will say, the guy is a lunatic. His head must be examined. He needs a psychiatric treatment. You can't hang, hang lunatics. So I'm asking, is God a lunatic? Maaz Allah, is God a lunatic? That he is now going to start each and every creature on earth, everybody must go to hell for what Adam and Eve did. They didn't kill anybody even. I will tell you, you know, <laughs> a small joke pertaining to this. Uh, at times, you know, people ask me questions from the floor, difficult questions. And only the difficult ones I remember. What happened at the first meeting? Wallah, I can't remember a thing. Unless you remind me, he says, you know, some fellow came and he asked you this, and you gave a very nice answer. So, oh, yes, 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 yes. Somebody asked you such and such a thing. I says, I can't remember. And Wallah, I can't remember. Because this to me is just a normal course. What I'm talking to you now, I won't be able to remember. Next time I come, say, hey, what was I speaking about? What subject? Then if you remind me, say, all right, I want to avoid that subject. I don't want to keep on repeating the same thing. 
it can never be a real repetition because this is not a written speech. So whatever is coming in my mind, I'm letting it off. So I'm delivering a lecture to a group of religious students, theological students in South Africa, uh, a theological seminary, Dutch Reformed Church, priests, and I'm speaking to them. They had invited me to speak on the original sin. This thing we are touching now. So I spoke, I explained that we agree so far, but we say sin is not inherited, sin is an acquisition. After each reaching a certain age, you become responsible for your actions. Prior to that, any human child that dies on earth dies as a Muslim. And we as Muslims, if there's nobody to bury the child, we are obligated to bury the child as a Muslim. Whether born in the home of a Hindu, a Christian, a Jew, or an atheist, we have to bury the child as a Muslim child. If there's nobody to bury, we have to do the job as Muslims. So, we say sin is an acquisition, it is not inherited. So, at question time, among so many other questions, one of the missionaries, trainee missionaries, he said, Mr. D. Dad, I said, every child is born pure, sinless, every human child. So he said, Mr. D. Dad, even if the child was born out of wedlock, the zina, I said, yes, even if the child was the zina, an offspring of adultery. He said, even if the father and the mother were both adulterers. I said, yes, even if they were adulterers. Zanis. I said, the child is sinless. You can't kill the child for the sins of the parents. If there is a law, I said, punish the parents. That child is innocent. You can't strangle the child because the child is waladu zina. The child is innocent. <sighs> that is Islam. Personal responsibility. You are not made responsible for your parents' mis misdeeds. So said, Mr. D. Dad, how can anything good come out of evil? Out of zina comes an innocent, pure child. How can anything good come out of evil? And this question was asked about 40 years ago, 30 years ago. I remember it because it made me think. You see, my habit had been that you ask a question, I answer, and I sit down. Somebody else comes along, asks a question, I stand up, I answer, and I sit down. Next guy comes along, he asks a question, I stand up, I answer, and I sit down. That is the system I have been following. So I was doing that. One question, I answer, I sit down. Next question, I answer, I sit down. Now, he's asking Mr. D that, how can anything good come out of evil? And it took me a little longer time to get up. Of course, the people, you won't realize, you said maybe he's an old man, you know, but I was much younger then. You know, he says, well, this guy is just getting up. No, 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 no. I didn't have the answer. I had an answer. I had an explanation. But at that explanation you can see ahead of you is very big. So you have to explain that physiologically there's nothing wrong with the child. Psychologically there's nothing wrong with the child. Morally there's nothing wrong with the child, and on and on. But I can see the mental block at the end of it. The man can still nod his head and he says, look, Mr. D, Dad, how can anything good come out of evil? Same, back again, in the circle. I could see all that. So therefore, <laughs> it takes me time to get up. I don't know what to say. But I have to open my mouth. <laughs> and Alhamdulillah, Allah gives it to you. He gives it to you. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهَدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلًا I said, whosoever strives in our way, we open up doorways for them. This is the law. You're working for him, he must help you. He gives you as if from his own presence. إِلْمِ لَدُنِّي No Gibrail, Gibrail comes to me. No angel comes to me and whispers in my ear. He said, tell him this. Tell him that, nothing. But this human computer, the computer that Allah has made, if you are leading your life, you're trying to lead according to the teachings of God, according to the Quran, He is there to help you. So I stand up and I say, I said, you see, eating an apple in the garden was a great sin. So they all agreed. That's apple or whatever, but they say apple. Figure it, let's say apple. Adam and Eve, they ate the apple, great sin. 
for which mankind, man was thrown out of the garden and we are all going to go to hell according to you. Great sin. Eating an apple in the garden was a great sin. He said, yes. But as, as, as against that, killing the only begotten son of God, one he produced in a billion years, only one. Only one son he produced according to the Christian. He only produced one son. And this son murdered. The murder of the only begotten son of God is the most heinous crime one can think of. He said, yes. And yet, I say, you say, out of that murder of the only Son of God came the gift of redemption. Redemption means free from sin, salvation, Jannah, out of that murder of the only Son of God. I said, you tell me, how can anything good come out of evil? <laughs> finished, finished, finished. You see, sir, Allah gives it to you. People ask again and again. He says, no, how do you get these ideas? Like, if you see the other tape, Swagat. You know Jimmy Swagat? He posed a problem for me. He said, look, Mr. D-Dad, we allowed you to come into America. Why don't you allow us to get into Makkah and Medina? Allow me, he said, to get into Makkah and Medina. Do you remember that? If you have seen the tape. Now everybody is tensed, including myself, everybody is tensed. Because now it needs a lengthy explanation. To say, you know, you people are filthy, dirty people, you people are pig eaters, you people are wine bibbers. What a, what a way of answering. But look, as we start, this, look, you people are going to mess up our places, therefore we don't want you. That is what you are expecting, everybody is expecting that. Now we have to start hammering him. You know, your way of life is not like our way of life and you're going to mess up Makkah and Medina with your prostitutes and your... your whatever you're going to do now, we have to open up our hotels for you, five-star hotels, so you can come along and see the sites. Business is business. Saudi or otherwise, once it's open, it's open to business. We want to do business. We want to make money, our, our, our businessmen. So it's going to mess up the whole place. Therefore... <laughs> no, no. I stood up and I said, very easy. It's very easy. You want to come into Makkah Madina? Very easy. I said, you see, every country has its rules and regulations of how to get into your country. Kuwait has it. Saudi Arabia has it. South Africa has it. Every nation has got their own rules of issuing visas. Zambia, at one stage, I was going to Zambia. And they made me to fill an affidavit, a form, application form. On the back is, a, is, a, is an affidavit I must make, saying that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime in southern Rhodesia. You see, south and northern Rhodesia were ruled by the British, and then Smith declared a UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence in southern Rhodesia. So, and he was not prepared to listen for 12 years, you know, the war went on, the Bush war, they call it, for 12 years. Eventually he came to his knees and now it is Zimbabwe, the country is now called Zimbabwe. But now Zambians are asking me to sign this affidavit that I do not recognize the illegitimate, in common language, the bastard regime of Smith, I don't recognize. So I said, look, this is not my business, man. Why get me involved into this? One day I might have to go there. And I said, look, you are calling us illegitimate. So why, why, this is the battle between you two, you fight it out. I said, no, if you don't sign this, you don't come to Zambia. They had a right, I had to sign. Because I wanted to go to Zambia, I had to sign the dotted line. I signed it. So, every country has got its rules. Saudi Arabia has the rules. And it's very easy. Saudi Arabia's rules are so easy, wallah. I said, you just read with your mouth, say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. <laughs> and visa is granted. They won't ask you whether you are an American Muslim, whether you are an Eskimo Muslim, whether you are a Hindi Muslim. You Muslim? Our doors are open. That's a visa requirement. Just utter the words and visa is granted. Now, you know, he must have the last word. He must have the last word. So towards the end, he had a chance. I didn't have a chance to come back. 
He said, all right, Mr. D, that if I can't get to Makkah and Medina, I didn't say he can't get to Makkah and Medina. He can. Just easy formula, say. In other words, you believe there is but one Allah and Muhammad this is his messenger. That's all. Visas are granted. So he said, if I can't get into Makkah or Medina, what about me appearing on TV? Makkah and Medina. He also appeared on TV. Because he was appearing in about 400 TV stations of the world. More than 400 TV stations of the world. His daily budget was a million dollars a day. That's swagat. So what about on TV? Now since I started it, I have to finish it. So, after the debate, I didn't have a chance to answer him. And I didn't know. You see, one doesn't know what you're going to answer. Is the computer does the job. Allah's computer. Because I'm, at times I'm watching tapes, my own tapes, old tapes. And at question time, I'm listening to the question. And I'm getting worried. What, how will this guy answer him? That's me. How will he answer that fellow? I can't. The mind is not working. But now while the guy is asking question, Allah is, in, is putting the answer in the computer. He is putting it in the computer. So the answer is easy. It's coming. It's coming. But now, so this is how it works. So I come to Abu Dhabi. And they had shown my tapes on, on Abu Dhabi TV, on Dubai TV. And um, the director of t television, he's telling me about this answer I gave. He liked it very much, he says. All Arab Muslims seem to have liked that answer very much. This is easy way to get the visa to Saudi Arabia, to Abha, for Makkah and Medina, very easy. I said, that was very good. I said, Mr. Dirat, how, how did you get it? I said, look, I don't know. <coughs> Allah helps. So I said, now he's asking, he wants to get on TV. So he's telling me the director is very easy. I said, what do you mean very easy? I can't seem to get on. How can it be easy for an enemy of God? He said, no, it's very easy, Mr. Didat. You see, you ask him to come to Abu Dhabi, and we will have a debate or two with you here. We will give him a first-class ticket for him and his wife, and we'll give him a five-star hotel accommodation. And you have a debate or two, and we'll have that televised by satellite throughout the Middle East, including Makkah and Medina. By satellite, they'll beam it right through, and Makkah and Medina can pick it up. His wish is granted. So I return home and I write to him. I says, Jimmy, your prayer is answered. Your prayer is granted. You want to appear on Makkah Madina TV? Easy. Now you tell me when you come with your wife, we give you a first class ticket, five star hotel accommodation, and we have a debate or two in Abu Dhabi, and they will do the rest. No answer. So I write him another letter, no answer. I send him a telegram, no answer. Then I get his telex number, I send him a telex, no answer. Nine months later, just before the scandal, nine months later, full period of gestation. You know the woman carries baby for nine months. You call them gestation. Nine, <laughs> full period of gestation, you know, he delivers the baby. He says, in his letter, he said, I want to have nothing to do with you. Because I was set up. You know what's a set up? You know, you corner the guy by some stratagem into some difficult position so you can hammer him, do something to him. You know, you, you dangle a golden carrot, and when the guy poor fellow comes with the golden carrot, you put a noose around his neck. That's called setting up. He says, I was set up. So I'm wondering, I says, how? I did nothing. Wallah, I said, I did nothing. I did nothing. What makes this man to say he was set up? I know the boys who organized the meeting, our school boys in the Louisiana University, they did nothing to set him up. That will corner him and put him into a trap. They did nothing, as far as I know, alhamdulillah. I did nothing, they did nothing, but it appears that he was set up. It does appear. He's, he's justified in saying he was set up. Though it's not true, but from his thinking, he was set up. 
How was he set up? Now, if you listen to the tape again, starting from the beginning, he says he apologizes that he had been attacking Islam and the Prophet ﷺ. Out of ignorance. He says, out of ignorance. And if you didn't hear what I had said on TV, I will not repeat it. Truly Islamic spirit that he showed. That look, that means now I won't repeat those filthy, dirty words, what I had used. Which means he's hitting you again. He won't put salt into the wound. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, such charming people, wonderful people. You know, you feel that, what, what grace they have. But now, when he uttered those words, our young men took exception to that. And they challenged him to a debate. That's the only thing the young men know. What else can you do with him? So challenge him to a debate. And the guy accepted. So I got accepted. So they brought a Pakistani or an Arab, uh, some learned man, and they had a debate in the university campus. And this guy, Swagard, made mincemeat out of our man. He bulldozed our man. Maybe our man had logic on his side, facts on his side, but this guy, you know, he's got a charisma. He's got those magical powers. He's got the gift of speech and his movements and all tantalizes the man. He, is, he was the greatest, I think, that Christianity has produced in the past thousand years. Greatest Christian orator, lecturer that Christianity had produced. When I was going for the debate, I meet the Sultan of Sharjah, Sheikh Muhammad Qasim, Qasimi, and I'm telling him, I says, you see this poster here, I'm going to debate this fellow in America. So he tells me, Mr. Didat, this guy is big shaitan. <laughs> so I'm telling him, I say, how do you know? You are a man in the Middle East, what do you know about the guy in America? He says, no, he says, when I was in America, in my hotel I was fiddling with the channels, and this guy came on. And he says, believe me, Mr. Didat, if he was swearing your mother, you can't switch him off. In anger you can smash the screen, but you can't switch him off. <laughs> That's too great. So, he had the charm. And the people, the audience, mostly Christians. So he awed our man. He bulldozed our man. What does the children do? Challenge him to another debate. So come on, let's have a second go at him. This time they get a new brother in faith. Very knowledgeable. That brother in faith, I learned a thing or two from him about the Quran and about the Bible from this new brother in faith. But he was five foot three. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Five foot three, clean shaven, like a schoolboy. And his voice also sounds like that of a girl. You know, soft spoken. And in the eyes of the audience, again, this guy bulldozed him. Facts were with us. Logic is with us. But this guy's personality and the audience reaction, all these things, you know, shrouded of a man. What do the boys do? Only thing they know. <laughs> Another debate. <laughs> See, I admire youth for that. They come out fighting. Our little ones coming out with stones. The spirit. They come for another debate. And this guy accepts. Third debate. With me was the third one. You see how he's being set up now. Watch. So, he agreed. So the boys phoned me. He says, look, uncle, we were fishing in shallow waters, catching little sprats, you know, the little fish, small fish, but we have got a shark, and we want somebody to gaff it out. A gaff is a long stick with a hook. You see, when the big fish comes near a shore, and you line it up, if you just pull out with a string, it can break. So you have to gaff it. It's a stick with a hook, and then you pull it out. We call it a gaff. We want somebody to gaff it out. I said, who's the man? He said, Swagat. Mm. I said, that's my meat. I said, when? It's the 3rd of November. I said, that's around the corner, man. He said, look, the guy said, take it or leave it. I said, take it. Take it. And they took it. Now you can see the setup. Can you see? As if the boys knew what they were doing. They had planned it, a strategy. They didn't. But it appears that it was a well-planned thing. First they threw a small bait. And the fish took it, swallowed it. They threw another small bait, the fish took it, swallowed it. Now they throw a bigger bait with a bigger hook. Ahmad did that. 
<laughs> and the guys get hooked. Can you see the setup? In the mind, he's, he's justified. He said, look, I can see the guys set me up to go and debate that. But if they said that first, maybe I wouldn't have accepted it. But now he says, one bite, another bite. And they didn't tell him who the third one is. And they bring a bigger bite, bait, you know, with a bigger hook, got hooked. But this is Allah's ways. If you are out to do work for him, he sets the stage for you. If you are out to do his job, he sets the stage for you to do the job. You see, he did it for Dawud alayhi salam. I know this is off the subject, all these things, but it's part of the whole training. At question time, you can ask anything about Christianity and Islam. You have heard so many things and you have seen so many of my tapes. There are 60 tapes are available, 60 different tapes. And I, I don't know, somehow people seem to enjoy. They seem to enjoy seeing it again and again. I have a very dear friend, by the way, Dr. Abdul Munim Billah in Abu Dhabi. He is a urologist. Human plumbing that he does. Urologist. So he tells me, he says, you know, Mr. D Dad, I saw your tape number 13, crucifixion or crucifixion, nine times. Nine times I saw it. I said, don't you get bored? I would get bored. Bored. I said, don't you get bored? He says, no, I'm an addict. <laughs> now, I didn't know that you can get addicted to tapes. I thought only drugs and alcohol you can get addicted to, and cigarettes. But no, he says you can get addicted to this. So you be on guard when you buy Didat's tapes. So I said, this is how Allah does the work. You see, the battle between the Palestinians and the Bani Israel, the Jews, has been going on for 3,000 years. 3,000 years, it's not yesterday, not today's job. All this what's happening is a 3,000 year old story. You read in the Bible again and again, again and again, that the Jews destroyed them utterly. And they killed men, women and children. Even sucklings were not spared. And even donkeys were killed. Yeah, even donkeys, the Bible says. They didn't have mercy even on the donkeys. I said, what the poor donkey had done. In Sabra and Shatila, if you had the Times magazine at that time, you see the picture there of the human beings lying down and horses killed. So I wrote a caption, I took out a pamphlet. The crimes of Begin in South Africa. Crimes of Begin, I published 100,000 of those. Crimes of Begin, and I reproduced that picture from the Times magazine. I said, these Jews, they couldn't find donkeys, so they kill horses. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Again and again, again, 100 times over, you read what they did to the Palestinians. It's a battle going on for 3,000 years. At one stage in their history, our brethren, they were not our brothers, and they were not Muslims, they just happened to be there. They are our brethren now. Our brethren, these Palestinians, they had a, a giant in their midst, an eight-foot giant called Jalut, Goliath. You always hear about David and Goliath. David and Goliath, they made a film, David and Goliath. Goliath is an eight-foot giant, abnormal. But the Palestinians were very happy. Say, hey, we got a giant in our midst now. Now let's see what the Jews can do. So they are on a hilltop, gathered with Jalut, and on the opposite hill are the Jews. So this Jalut is shouting, Say, you Jews, is there anybody there who can take me on? I'll chew you alive. And really, if he can grab any one of those, he could crush them. Allah had given him the size and the strength. But while he's shouting, you see an eight-foot giant is abnormal. Abnormal. An abnormal person, he behaves abnormally. You know, he's not steady on his feet. Eight-foot giant on the hill. You see, he's swaying as if he had taken some drugs or alcohol. He didn't. But it appears, you know, he's shouting like a drunken man, say, you Jews, I'll fix you up and all that, come. <laughs> so, the Jews were terrified. They were shivering in their pants. I don't know whether they used to wear pants those days. But figuratively, they're shivering in their pants. So, Daud is there. What is he doing? He is looking after his father's sheep. He was a shepherd boy. He was no prophet then. He is there, looking after his father's sheep. You see, if the battle was taking place here, and if Dawood was looking, grazing his sheep where the Sheraton is, you would never have heard of Dawood. You know that? He had to be there, year short of Jalut, 
that Jalud is shouting and he is hearing there on the opposite hill what this guy is saying and to him it makes his mouth water. So what an opportunity. This guy is a sitting duck man, sitting target for me. Little doubt for the Jews, the veterans of so many wars, they are terrified, petrified at this huge giant. So little doubt comes to Talut, Talut, the commander Saul, they call him Saul, and tells him, he says, look, I'm prepared to take this fellow on. So what? You? <laughs> we veterans of so many wars, <laughs> you know, we are terrified in you. He said, I'll take him on. He said, go, go, man. Look after your father's sheep. He said, look, that guy, you know, he's so enthusiastic. You know, so easy. You know, I'll knock him over. The young man, he's got something in his mind. So Talut says, look, man, that type of enthusiasm, you don't squash it. He said, look, here's my sword and my shield. So little Dawood says, look, I don't know this. In my life, I never handled it. Maybe the sword is too heavy for it. He said, look, I got my sling. So what? With a toy? It's a joke. What a joke. We with swords and shields, we can't take him on. And now you with a sling, you want to fight him. With a stone. Sling. He says, look, man, you don't know. You know what I can do with this. That enthusiasm. Oh, power Saul, the commander. He said, all right, go, go. You want to commit suicide? Go. So, Hazrat Dawud he walks down the hill, he picks up a few pebbles, stones, the ones that our children are carrying now. Look, the stones are doing something. What all our other efforts had failed so far, what the little children with the stones are achieving, same story is being repeated. He picks up the stones, he puts one in the pouch of the sling, it was an old-fashioned sling, not the one with the rubber because rubber was not invented. So he puts it in, and two strings, he swings it, ving, 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 gains momentum, and at the right moment he lets go one side of the string for the missile, the stone to fly. He has been practicing this, he has been killing birds with it, he has been killing rabbits with this. So, he is a good marksman. What he has, he uses. That's what Allah wants us to do. What you got, you use. No, no, no. You want sophisticated weapons. You want laser guns. You wait till doomsday. You might not get them. Use what you have. What Allah gave you, use it now. And you see how effective it is. However silly and toy like it looks. He puts it in and he swings and he lets go. And the missile hits Jalut on the forehead. Cracks his skull and he falls. And little Dawood rushes up. Takes his own sword, his own sword, and chops off his head. So Allah records it for us in the Holy Quran. He says, وَقَتَلَ دَعُودُ جَالُوتَ وَعَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَعَلَّمُهُ مِمَّا يَشَاءَ And Dawood killed Jalut, and Allah gave him dominion, and wisdom, and whatever else he willed. So the Jews say, David killed Goliath. The Christians say, David killed Goliath. We say, Dawood killed Jalut. I said, poor Jalut was set up. Can't you see? He was set up for this. Who did the setting up? The Palestinians? No. The Jews? No. There is somebody at work. He is at work. Wallah, he's working all the time. Allah is working all the time. He's using everybody. If you allow yourself to be used in his way. If not, you find a thousand excuses. Thousand excuses, like one following the newspaper, some Arab newspaper. Name, beautiful name, Abdullah Ahmad Hussein. I am Ahmad Hussein. You know that? I am Ahmad Hussein. Ahmad Hussein did that. When I was in Pakistan, I didn't use the word did that because the people get puzzled. What's did that? You see, now you know I said, well, did that. It's a surname, you see, acquired from my Hindu ancestors. That surname remains. What caste or breed I come from. That indicates did that. It's not a Muslim name. Ahmad Hussein. My name Ahmad. My father is Hussein. Ahmad Hussein. My brother is Abdullah. This guy. Abdullah, Ahmad Hussein. What beautiful combination of names. He wants to know how did this guy did that get into Kuwait. Imagine, he wants to know how did I get here. You know, I'm creating trouble here. I'm creating, you know, turmoil here for you people. Wallah, you read that. The number of charges he has made in that. The coward, the munafik, he is not coming forward. If he's here, is he here? Let him come forward and ask me the question. You hit me in the newspaper. What do you want me to do? How can I respond to a dozen different charges? 
You know, things that he says. He says, you know, I am not an Arab, and I'm telling Arabs what to do. <laughs> he says, you see, Allah sent prophets to every nation according in their own language. That's what Allah says. To every nation he sent, I mean, ummatin illa khala fiha nasir. And there never was a people without a warner having been sent out himself. Well, a kulli qawmin had, and to every nation a guide. But those guides came to preach to them in their own language. That's the law of God. Now, on that basis I should reject Islam. All the non-Arabs must reject Islam. Because Muhammad came in to the Arabs in the Arabic language. He should come to me and speak to me in Gujarati. Huh? He must talk to the guys in Swahili and in the, in the Fulani language. That is an amazing, a leading newspaper can put that front page news. Front page news. You know, I don't know. I don't know who is running the minds of people here. That munafik, if he's here, let him come forward and ask me whatever question you want. How I got into Kuwait? How is it that a non-Arab is speaking to Arabs? I have no right. Am I not your brother? No, that's, that's his implies. He says, no, you see. <laughs> Leave it out. Leave it out. So, my dear brethren, you see, the battle is on. It will ever be on. Between the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. The Jews and the Christians on one side, and the Muslims on the other side. Allah Bari Talat gives us that reminder. The first night that I spoke, I started with the ayah, وَلَن tarda أَنْكَ yahudo وَلَن nasara hatta تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ that the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslim. No mind what you do. You remember those of you that were here? Look, this is what Allah says. Unless He doesn't know what He's talking about. Don't you, don't you think that Allah knows what He's telling you? He says, they will never, never be satisfied with you until you follow the brand of religion. That's all. You become a Christian. Peace with the Christians. But he said, look, what about Palestinian brother? And I said, look, man, you are living together. Allah doesn't say go and kill them. In Egypt, I'm not telling go and kill the cops. What it means is that now you share your deen. Share it with them. And these are the first people with whom we should have shared our deen. First people. They were the fittest people to receive the message. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, again, He says, Kuntum khaira ummatin He says, you are the best of people evolved for mankind. For mankind, not for yourselves, you Arabs. For mankind, ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna nin munkar. Because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. And the rest of the ayah, one ayah, this is only half. You never hear the other half. I haven't heard it in all my life. No learned man has ever spoken about the other half. In every commentary, I haven't seen a commentary on the other half. The other half says, other half of that one ayah. He says, وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ But if the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them. In others, it will be better for you. Or Muslims, it will be better for you. مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Among them, there are good people, moments. وَأَكْثَرُهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Clear picture. What do you do? The good ones you leave him? The bad ones you leave him? He says, it's bad eggs? It's bad customer? No, both of them are your customers. They are all your customers. The good one, how do you approach him? How do you talk to him? Allah is showing you in the Quran. Allah is showing you everything is spelled out for you. But nobody really reads the Quran. That's the trouble. I'm a Hindi. I don't know Arabic. But somehow, I have been forced to see things in the Quran. Forced. Wallah, forced. I was also set up. I am also set up. All this is a set up. I didn't aspire for this. I didn't aspire for the King Faisal Award. I didn't aspire for anything. Wallah, nothing. I am forced into situations which brought me to this. Forced. Set up. I was giving explanation last night. Of course, I couldn't speak as fluently as I'm speaking now, because I had to talk in little chunks. See, I say a few words, and the translator. And now while he's translating, my mind is wondering, what shall I say next? No, how, what to do? What little chunk more, that morsel I can put in his mouth? Hell, hell, I've been going through hell all these days. Today I'm in heaven. You know I'm in heaven today with you all. <laughs> how Allah says, among them there are moments, Good people, 
and I'm telling our ladies some new sister reverse to Islam in the Sheraton upstairs, I was telling them how to do the job with the good people. I said, use the Quran, Allah's Kalam. Let Allah do the talking. Let him be your advocate. You can't get a better advocate than Allah Bari Ta'ala himself. Make him to talk. He and he's talking in the Quran for you. Call them. Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'ala. Why aren't you calling them? You know why? You are afraid. Afraid of what? Not that they'll bash you. No, no, no. You are afraid you're going to make a fool of yourself. And we don't like to make a fool of ourselves. All of us. We don't want to make a fool of ourselves. Because we are not equipped with knowledge. Might we have, power we have in some of the countries. In Egypt you got power, might. The bulk of the people are Muslims. You are not afraid of them. They are only 10%. Or five percent, twenty percent, whatever. But you are the rulers in the land. You are not afraid of them that they'll bash your head, no. But you are afraid to open your mouth. Why? Because you have no knowledge. You're going to make a fool of yourself. Wallah, you make a fool of yourself. The learned man of the Christian comes to you. You remember I gave you. How many of you were here that first meeting? Please put up your hands. Very few. That first meeting here. I gave, I said, now the Christians have evolved a new system, a new way of dealing with us. Previously, they were attacking. Muhammad was an imposter. He had so many wives. He copied his book from the Jews and the Christians. He spread his religion at the point of the sword. So if you don't accept some chop of your heads, that type of thing, didn't gather honey, didn't get converts. So now the Orientalist, they are studying, studying psychology. And I gave you so many things here. Look, the system that they're using to catch Muslim fish. I showed you. Now, there are certain Muslims who react. Maybe their mothers are Christians. Maybe their wife is a Christian. Or their brother-in-law is a Christian. Or they're working for a Christian. They have Muslim names. Abdullah, Abdullah, Ahmad Hussein. Who can doubt his Islamicity? But you study him. You study the letter. And he says, he's a kafir of the highest order. Munafik of the highest order. He has learned all these techniques from the Jews. I can give you examples after example. Let him come forward and speak to me. In public here, talk to me, the Munafik. So you start throwing stones at the man. You see, give him, give him a black, bad, bad name. <laughs> a character assassination. The Khabis hasn't had the guts to pull a trigger, so he's doing it with a pen. Let him come forward. Come forward, and the likes of them, come forward. Talk to me. Accuse me on my face that you are not a Muslim. Say so, that I'm a Qadiani. Say so, I'm a Baha'i. Say so, I'm a Shia. Say so. You give me a chance. Allah says, Ya you Allah amanu. O you who believe. In jaakum fasikun bi nabain fatabayyanu. When a fasik, a perverted transgressor comes and tells you something, verify it. Fatabayyanu antusibu qawman bi jahalatin. That may be in ignorance you harm some people. But, I don't know. He's, he's an Arab. He knows Arabic. He said, why should a non-Arab come and speak to Arabs? Aren't there Arabs enough here to talk to you people? Why do you? Are you all fools? Why do you come to listen to me? I want to know. I'm not an Arab. In the masjid, I see mostly Arabs here. I don't see all, the, all those red turbans, you know. But in the masjid, I can't see any bareheaded people. I see all the... Why do they come to listen to me? And they come again and again. If I'm your enemy, you can't be such fools, man that you come and listen to me again and again, once is enough. Once you recognize that this guy is not our friend, next time you keep him at arm's length. You don't go and listen to him again, but you people are coming again and again, what for? Are you fools? No. You seem to get something from me. That is why you are coming. And I enjoy talking to you. I want to share with you my experiences. So, that first night, I said the new techniques that they are using, now they're coming to our people. I'm warning you beforehand. And they are now finding common grounds. This is a natural thing. Allah showed us. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa im bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us. That's a secret. Anybody, everybody, try and find common grounds on which to start. So now they don't read the Quran, but they s discovered that. Through study, psychology, they studied, they said, no, this is the way, common grounds. So they find common grounds with you now. 
common grounds with you. They said, you believe in Jesus? You got to say yes. It's all prepared. He knows the answers beforehand. He just wants to convict you with your own mouth. You believe in Jesus? He said, yes. He said, you know, he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He said, yes, yes, we believe that. We believe that. He says, you know, he was born miraculously, miraculously, without any male intervention. He said, yes, no, no, we accept that. Mojiza. He says, was Muhammad so born? You're Muhammad. Was he born like that? So he says, no, he had a father and a mother. That's all. That's all. He doesn't tell you anymore. Jesus is a degree above Muhammad. He doesn't say that, but he told you. He says, you know, Jesus is the Masih, Messiah, translated Christ. You accept that? He said, of course. He's Masihullah. We accept. Allah tells us, Masihu is Sabnu Maryama. Allah tells you. We accept. He says, was Muhammad Masihullah? He said, no, he's Rasulullah. But you see, Isa is Rasul and Masih in the Quran. You know that? Rasul and Ilah Bani Israel. Masihu is Sabnu Maryama. He's Rasul and Masih. Your prophet is only a Rasul. In the Quran. He said, well, yes. It is so. Another degree for Jesus. He says, you know, Jesus gave life to the dead, which is the prerogative of Allah. Allah's right to give life and death is in his hands. But Jesus was given that power to give life to the dead. You know a little bit more than that. So he said, Bismillah, with Allah's help, with his permission. He said, yes, yes. Did Muhammad give life to the dead, Bismillah? Did he? So he said, look, I don't know. I, my, my answer, these are my answers. I said, look, I don't know. Maybe somebody might bring in some kitab and say, look, you are an ignorant fellow, it is there. But look, I don't know. Another degree for Jesus. He says, you know, Jesus, Christ, he's in heaven. He said, yes. He's alive. He said, yes. He's coming back. He said, yes. Where is your prophet Muhammad? He said, no, he's buried in Medina. He said, perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. He said, no, 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 we believe he's Hayatun Nabi, he's a living prophet. He said, well, look, that's metaphysically. But physically, maybe his bones have rotted in the grave. So he says, maybe another degree for Jesus. These are common grounds he's finding with you now. Convicting you from your own mouth. He said, don't you think God had a purpose in doing all that? He does things for nothing. Huh? He does things for nothing. When you meet Kurbani a few months ago, Idul Adha, you look for a sheep or a goat or a cow that had no blemish, no faults. Right? Horn not broken, ear not cut, not blind, not limping. Right? You say, right. So if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice, is he going to look for second best? You know who is second best? He proved it to you from your own mouth. According to what he put to you, Muhammad is second best. Will he look for second best? Go and argue with him. Argue with him. Difficult. Well, it's difficult. But it's very easy if you just armed yourself. You armed yourself with knowledge. It is so easy and it's a joy and a pleasure playing chess with them. This is intellectual chess. All right. He said he's born without a father. We agree. But he said, does that make him God? Does that make him God? Or the veritable son of God? He said, look. Allah tells us in the Quran, Inna masala Isa in the Allahi kamasali Adama Abakari. He started, he gave the message. I don't know whether he really did intend to do this, but he did it. Allah makes him to do it. Maybe he was also set up. He was set up here. Inna masala Isa in the Allahi kamasali Adama. The similitude, the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is like that of Adam. Khalaqahum in Turabin, he created him from dust. Thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. And he said, be and he was. So if Adam is the son of God, or God because he had no father, I'm sorry, if Jesus is the son of God and God because he had no father, then Adam is a greater God according to your logic. Do you accept that? He says, no, why not? This is your logic, man. Then in the book of Hebrews, in the Bible, Allah is telling us to ask him for his burhan, kul hautu burhanakum, which we haven't done in a thousand years. He says, hautu burhanakum, asking for his burhan. This is his burhan, the Holy Bible. He says, this is what? I said, right. Let's see, book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 1, it speaks about Melchizedek, the high priest of Salam, Salam, Islam, Jerusalem, Baitul Muqaddas, the high priest of Salam. It says, without father, 
without mother, without beginning, without end. Can you imagine a priest without father, as good as Jesus, without mother, as good as Adam, greater than Jesus, without mother, without beginning, greater than the Lot, because Isa al had a beginning in the stable. They say he started his birth in the stable, without end. Jesus had an apparent end on the cross, according to them, that he died on the cross. So from every point of view, Melchizedek is a greater God than Jesus can ever be at any time for anything without Father. This is your book. This is your Burhan tells us that. Do, why don't you worship Melchizedek? Ask him. Huh? Jesus, because there's got no Father, you worship him as God. Why don't you worship Melchizedek? He's got no Father, no Mother, no beginning, no end. Who is greater? Come on, your reason, your logic, man. Who is greater? Wallah, it is so easy to deal with these things if you only take a little trouble. But we won't take the trouble. We want those small uh, homeopathic pills, not even those allopathic, you know, those big, big capsules that the doctors give us. No, no, you want the tiny little things, and you think everything will be supplied to you. You'll become a karate expert. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You have to do a little bit of exercise. And to do that little bit of exercise, here, I said, look, this, these are those stones. These are the stones that Hazrat Dawud picked up. You do the same, pick them up. The God that never was. Resurrection or resuscitation. Who moved the stone? What was the sign of Jonah? Christ in Islam. This book will answer all these four things I post to you. Christ in Islam. What the Bible says about Muhammad. And on and on. Get them. Arm yourself that you can do a job for Allah's sake. And don't become a fool in people's sight. They come along and make nests in your head. They are making nests in our heads. They are using us as a punching bag for practice. Allah has not put that such a role for us, that you become punching bags for people. In boxing they use that, you know, for exercise. This is not a punching bag. We are not punching bags. This is not waste paper baskets, that they come and put any rubbish in your head. Learn to talk, learn to open your mouth, arm yourself. And for this, these books are available. They will be available. Our, our brother, Dr. Adil Al-Falah, inshallah, he will be handling my tapes and uh, my booklets here in, in Kuwait. So with these words, I sit down. I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity for the first time since my arrival that I could speak to you all uh, unfettered, you know, without being tied down. This is the first time I was a little freer and I enjoyed talking to you all. Wa akhru dawan an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. On behalf of International Islamic Charitable Foundation, on behalf of Kerala Islamic Group, on behalf of the thousands of brothers who listened to your speech tonight, and on, uh, on behalf of hundreds of thousands of brothers who are going to witness your speech in TV and other media and on behalf of our future edicts of your taps, I thank Brother Didat for your stimulating, thought-provoking speech. Now brothers, we have to vacate this hall within half an hour time. So please ask, come forward as Brother Didat desires, come forward and ask your questions. Don't, uh, the question should be concise. Don't Take all the, all the time for questioning only. Give much time to do that to speak. This way? Yes. Okay, no? Hello. Uh, brother, did... Yes. My name is Atiq Ahmed and I am Pakistani. Working here as a teacher. Uh, Brother Ahmad Didad, <clears throat> the way you are doing your job seems to be an unnecessary confrontation against those who are betterly equipped and betterly strengthened with the material forces. Can't we do our job without any confrontation? Thank you. Yes, 
the brother Abdul Latif, uh, Ahmad Latif, Latif Ahmad, Atik Ahmad, yes. He says, now can't we do our job without any confrontation? If there was such a way, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would have done it. You see, when he opened his mouth, the mushrifs of Makkah, they went on the war path against him. You remember? If you read Islamic history, you know that our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he opened his mouth, the mushriks of Makkah wanted to kill him. Do you know that? That's the beginning, yes. That they wanted to kill him. The Sahabas had to make two hijras for Abyssinia. He had to flee for his life. When he goes to Medina, the Jews were out to destroy him. The Christians were out to destroy him. The Munafiks of Medina wanted to destroy him. You know all that. What was the reason? Didn't he know how to talk? This was creating confrontation. It's confrontation. You as a Christian, you are a Christian, I take it. You are a Muslim. Because name means nothing. You know that I got here, uh, Sultan Muhammad, he's a, he's a Murtad. I see here another one here, K.K. Alawi, another Murtad. I see here, John uh, Abdul Subhan, another Murtad. So names mean nothing. You see, because we find a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm not accusing you. But we find a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. In Pakistan, I had them. Wolves in sheep's clothing, you see. There's Abdullah Ahmad Hussein. Whether he is a Christian or not, we don't know. He may be a born-again Christian, but his name he has retained. So, you see, Allah tells us, if you are a Muslim, only if you are a Muslim, now I can talk to you more easily. You as a Muslim, you read the Quran. You accept this Quran as Allah's Kalam? Alhamdulillah. So Allah tells you to tell them, وَلَا تَكُولُوا salasa. Don't say Trinity. Of course, you can say more softly than that. You see, unfortunately me, Allah has made me like that. I said, وَلَا تَكُولُوا salasa. Don't say Trinity. إِن تَهُوا خَيْرًا لَكُمْ This is, stop it, it will be better for you. إِنَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَهُمْ وَاحِدٌ For your Allah is one Allah. Confrontation. Is it not? Is it not a confrontation? The man, his foundation of his religion is Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Trinity. And you telling him, don't say Trinity. I'm asking you, as a Muslim, is that not a confrontation? It is. So that verse must be taken out of the Quran and thrown away. I read an ayah during my speech. Qul, ya halal kitab, say, O people of the book, la taghlu fi dinikum, say, do not go to extremes in your religion. Aren't you interfering? Hmm? In your religion, this is the Quran. Allah is telling you to tell him. You say, no, I won't tell him, because there will be a confrontation. I want to know whether you are a Muslim. I want to know whether you are a Muslim. And Allah says, tell him, Qul means say, means tell them. La taqlu fi dinakum, wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. Innama al-masihu isa ibn Maryam rasulullah, wa kalimatuhu alqaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minuhum, faaminu billahi wa rasulih. You tell them, and the guy is getting provoked. What can you do? This is Allah's instructions to you. If you don't want to do it, that's your business. Go to hell. You don't want to do the job? Allah says, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمٌ غَيْرَكُمْ He'll substitute in your place another people. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُنُوا مَسَالَكُمْ They won't be like you. You avoided that confrontation in Spain. When I say you, we Muslims. 800 years you rule that country. And you were thinking of your wives, your Christian wives, and your brother-in-laws and your son-in-laws, and your worldly considerations, your nice homes and your parks and gardens. That is what was your interest. What happened? Wiped out to a man. Yastabdul qawman khayrakum. This is the punishment for you. You deserve it. Allah tells you, tell them. Lakat kafar al-lazina qalu inna Allah al-masih ibn Maryam. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God, is making kufar. It's an act of blasphemy, treason against Allah. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But Christ said, يَا بَنِ إِسْرَائِيلِ O children of Israel, لَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ Worship Allah, رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever will associate anyone with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِلْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannah haram for them. Paradise will be forbidden for them. وَمَعْوَاهُ النَّارِ And the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. 
When you deliver the message, now mind how diplomatically you do it, it's going to create reaction. Because it's, it's going against the grain of the, the outsider. You see, everything you're telling him, he says, look man, you are wrong. You are a pig eater, you mustn't eat pig. He's drinking, so you mustn't drink. Every step you are confronting the man. Your way of life is a confrontation. If you put on a topi, you are an, uh, you are an offense. You are an offense to the Christian, the very fact that you identify yourself as a Muslim, it's an offense. You are a challenge. You are a challenge to him. And they hate you like poison. They hate you like poison, but what can they do? They conquered my land and they tried to Christianize us. Long story. They conquered Malaysia, when the kind of Christianize them. Indonesia, there are 15 million Indonesians already perverted into Christianity. Bangladeshis, they're boasting they've perverted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. Pakistan, they've perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than the previous hundred years of British rule. In Africa, there are 35,000 full-time crusaders occupied trying to change our people. And you say, I mustn't tell them anything because what I'm telling them is creating confrontation. I mustn't arm these people. <laughs> no, my brother. You see, the Christian has a right. He has a right to tell me, Mr. D, that you are attacking my religion. He has a right. But this is my teaching. In my country, these books that I published, here, crucifixion or crucifixion. Crucifixion, F-I-X-I-N, means to fix up a person on the cross and kill him, or F-I-C-T-I-N, fiction. Is it a fiction, fairy tale? So I prove from in this book, from the Bible, that it was a fiction. Because Allah tells me so in the Quran. He says, They're only following conjecture, guesswork, fiction. يقينن, for a surety they killed him not. Now I prove that in this book by using the Christian Bible. And this is one of the most potent weapons that we have developed. And this was brought to the uh, director of of, of in, uh, not information, the director of um, publications in South Africa, director of publications. He said, look, this is a dangerous book and it should be banned. And we went to court and we won the case against the government of South Africa. The judge gave the verdict, he said, look, these are bona fide beliefs. The Christian government, the most racist nation on earth, maybe second only to Israel, or beating number two compared to Israel, most racist nation on earth, apartheid, you heard about apartheid, that stinking name, no people don't want to give me visa because of that. That nation, they says, look, there's nothing wrong. It's the most dangerous book to my faith, they say. But according to the constitutions of our country, this does not infringe any law. Go ahead. So we had printed a hundred thousand, then so we print another hundred thousand, and then we print another fifty thousand. Quarter million we have done so far. And we want you to do the same. This is the most potent book. But now, it is an offense to the Christian. I'm speaking mildly what the Bible says about Muhammad. They come along, the missionaries, and they want to give battle to me. You see, it's an offense. No man, how nicely you put it. You say, we believe in Jesus. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He was the Messiah, he was born miraculously, he gave life to the dead, all that. Does that satisfy the Christian? I'm asking, does that satisfy the Christian? No. He said, but you don't accept him as the, your savior. You know, you don't accept him as your God. So what are you going to do? Offense. You want to say, Muhammad is foretold in the Bible, that's all. But at question time, you watch, see my tapes. At every question time in my country, otherwise the Christian is coming along, I'm delivering a talk on this, 
and he comes out, but you don't accept Jesus, you don't accept the Trinity. Confrontation. If you want to deliver the message, there will be confrontation. If you don't want to, which you haven't done, no confrontation. You can live in peace. In the meantime, you can steal your children. And they're stealing. In, where you come from? Pakistan. Right. Sialkot. You know Sialkot? It has a Christian population of 200,000 on the border with India. Right, right, right. So they're stealing your people. They're stealing your children. And as soon as Pharaoh comes out and warns you, that look, the house is on fire. You say, I'm, I'm the enemy. No, you're a lunatic, man. You are loonies. I am trying to warn you that the house is on fire. If it's false, gag me. But in the meantime, I'm telling you, brothers, wake up, man. Look, arm yourself with knowledge that you can talk to them. But that doesn't mean it's not going to create offense. Our Nabi Karim says, the, the best of man, mankind, Allah says, Lakat kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. It's the most certain in the Apostle of Allah. You have the best exemplar, a paragon of virtue, you know, the most sweet, kind hearted person, and he created offense. Mushriks want to kill him, Jews want to kill him, uh, Christians want to kill him, Munafis want to kill him. Four different groups of people all out to destroy the man. Why? Because he didn't know how to talk. Is that what you're going to say? Maybe you could have done better. Astaghfirullah. Yes, next one. Gerald Salou, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kuwait. Uh, Sheikh Didat, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm British. I had the pleasure of hearing uh, Sheikh Didat before in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm a Christian. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Emir and the Crown Prince of this country for the freedom they give for all people to worship God, uh, the one God, in the way uh, they would like. Secondly, I'd like to say I have read the Quran. I have a copy of it here. Uh, it's not Yusuf Ali, I have Yusuf Ali. This is a smaller one uh, by Arbery. Um, I'd like first to say about the chairman at the beginning, he said some things about the Arabs. Praise God for the Arabs. Uh, I teach English uh, to doctors who are training. The Arabs uh, gave much to medicine uh, in Europe. And uh, there's an Egyptian heart surgeon who works in London who uh, is a very famous heart surgeon. So all I can say is praise God uh, for the Arabs. Uh, I have one question. Um, firstly, I, I'd like to remind us what it says in the Quran, and it says that Christians and Muslims are closest to one another. This is what it says in the Quran. And I thank God for the opportunity to listen, and may we always be able to share together. And when we share, may we share with patience and with love and peace and not, as we did in the Crusades, fighting each other. May God forgive us for these atrocities of the past. I'm not a scholar, but I have one question I have read a little bit. It seems the main difference, uh, really, is on the, set, is the person of uh, Jesus Christ, who the Quran, uh, as you said, does speak very highly of. Now, I have one question. As I say, I'm not a scholar. Um, my question is, if Jesus is God's word, as it says in the Quran, that's Kalimit Allah, and also God's Spirit, Ruh Allah, then why do we need to separate him from God? For if God has no spirit, then he would be dead, which is quite impossible. And if he has no word, he must be dumb, which is also impossible. So it's not a problem for us, because... Uh, to call Jesus the Son of God, which I know you would not accept, but it's not a problem for us to say this because, as it says in the Quran, that Jesus is God's word, Kalamit Allah. Uh, he, in other words, he speaks and he is also God's spirit, Ruh Allah. And uh, I would also like to say, finally, then I'll sit down, that you can talk as much as you like about Christianity, but it is a personal experience of the living God. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Spirit of God down for all people. And unless you have that Spirit inside you, you can talk as much as you like about Christianity, but you will not know God in the way Christians claim. And that's all I can say. Thank you for listening. And uh, as I say, may we go our different ways in peace. Thank you. 
a theologically uh, our questioner, Christian brother, has put so many things, but in essence, if I'm correct, that the Quran describes Isa as the Word of God and as the Spirit of God, and you can't separate the Spirit from God. In other words, He is God. Am I correct in my assumption? That's it. You see, we seem to have a little broader understanding. This word of God, that he is the word, wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu, chapter 3, verse 45, Surah Al Imran, wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu, so behold the angel said, O Mary, inna Allaha yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu, Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. Is Muhul Masih, his name will be the Messiah, and so on and so on. He is a word from Allah. What is a word? The Christians say the word of God is God. His understanding is that the word of God is God. The Hindus, my ancestors, they say that the word of God is God. You see, as such, he said, how did God create this universe? The Bible says, in the book of Corinthians, I'm sure you know, you are not a scholar, but you know, you are familiar with the Bible. In the book of Corinthians, it is said that by faith we know that the heavens and the earth were created by the word of God, and that the things visible came through the force invisible. In the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, the word is, and he said, let there be light. Let there be light, four words. And there was light. So everything that God created was by his word. By his will. It's another word for we say by his will. Because God doesn't use words like I'm using now. You know, word of mouth. Depending upon my mouth, my teeth, my tongue, my larynx, my lungs, and your ears, all these things is dependent on all these factors. No, the Word of God is His will. He created everything by His will. And as such, God Almighty created Jesus. It is not God, but it is His Word. He said, Sun, His Word came into being. Moon, stars, heaven, earth, fish, fowl, whatever he uttered, actually what he willed, they all came into being. But now the word of God is not God according to Islamic understanding. The word of God is his word, but it is not him. My Hindu cousins, they say the word of God is God. So when he said man, man is also God. Monkey, so we worship the monkey. Elephant, he worshiped the elephant. Everything is God's word. The cow, God said cow, made the cow, we worship the cow. Because everything is God's word. We say the word of God is not him. It is his. The difference is in your understanding, you say the word of God is God. You say no, the word of God is not God. It is his word. But it is not him. As my words are not me. I'm speaking to you almost an hour now. And I can speak to you for hours. But as I'm speaking to you, I'm not diminishing in size. I'm the same deed. I'll get tired. I'm an old machine. But I can keep on talking. I can keep on talking. Thousands of words, millions of words. But you see me the same. Why? Because my words are not me. If it was me, I'll start getting less and less. A molecule of two, five, ten, getting less. So it is in the understanding, the Christian agrees that everything that God created was by his word. They are his words, but they are not him. They make an exception that in the case of Jesus, it is him. See, they make an exception. He is the spirit. Yes. What did God breathe into Adam? The Bible says he breathed into him of his spirit. Did the spirit come out and go inside Adam? No. No, that means it is his, his spirit, his creation. The angels are his spirits. They are not him. They are his, but they are not him. 
Now that is our idea, concept, as given in Islam. Jesus Christ is one of the mightiest messengers of God, but he is not God and he is not the begotten son of God. He is not the begotten son. See, because the Christian in your catechism, the Anglican and the Lutheran and the Presbyterian and the Roman Catholic, they say, Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. You remember that, sir? Begotten, not made. So we are asking the Englishman, you see, he doesn't want to hear that. The American, I said, he doesn't want to hear that. I am asking, you said, begotten, not made. I am asking, what are you trying to emphasize? What are you really trying to tell me? See, this young man here, please stand up, Abdul Latif, stand up. If I call you my son, do you mind it? No. Do you think your mother will mind it? No. You don't mind me calling you my son. Sit down. But now, I'm visiting your house with some friends. And I'm calling uh, your ma. I said, look, where is Abdul Latif, my son? She says, he's just gone to the shop. He's going to buy some milk. And presently you come, you return. So we embrace my son. You know, oh, no, I love you so much and all that. Sit down. You say, sit down, sit down. Now, my companion who doesn't know a relationship is asking me. He said, is he really your son? <laughs> so I said, no. You see, this young man, he loves me like a father, like a grandfather. And I love him like my child. I call him my son. It is metaphorical. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, the meaning changes. You know that? You know I'm swearing him. The worst swearing I can give him. But in a beautiful language. He is my begotten son, meaning I have something to do with his mother. And wallah, I haven't seen her what she looks like. <laughs> what am I saying? He is my begotten son. So he understands the meaning now. He said, uncle, what did you say? I said, no, I don't mean that. I said, I don't mean that. But I'm still telling, doesn't he look like my Yusuf? My Yusuf, doesn't he look like him? What am I saying? I'm putting salt into the wound. That he is an illegitimate child. He's not his father's child, he's mine. He is in common language a bastard. Stuff all. Can you see? I'm swearing him in the most beautiful language. I said, but when I'm cornered, I said, I don't mean that. Then I said, why do you why do you say why do you say that? You say Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made. Ask any Englishman. Any English-speaking person who is a Christian, you say, begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? What are you really trying to tell me? That Jesus was begotten, not made. Because in his book, the Bible, God has got sons by the tons. Tons. You know a ton? 2,000 pounds was a ton. I don't know whether you use that anymore. 2,000 pounds, ton. You have, God has got sons by the ton in this Bible. Book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, it says, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them to wife all that they chose. Next verse. And when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, men had intercourse with them they bore, and bore children to them, they became great men of old, men of renown. How many sons did he have? In the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. In the New Testament, we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Every Tom, Dick and Harry, if you follow the will and plan of God, in the language of the Jew, you are a godly person, you are a son of God. Like that, God has got sons by the tons. But you say, no, Jesus is not like that. He was begotten, not made. So explain. Ask any Christian, please explain. And it is shattering, wallah, shattering. Therefore, say, that is a bad fellow. You point at him, accuse him and swear him, he doesn't mind. He, is gentle, he can take it. But I said, look, please explain. It's shattering. Your language. You said begotten, not made. What are you really trying to tell me? Come on, come on, tell me. I said, this is my begotten, not made, not metaphorically, but literally. What am I saying? What am I saying? Words, if they have any meaning, what do they mean? Therefore, Allah reacts very strongly in the Quran. And they say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing can give a like this. 
giving him an animal nature, the lower animal functions of sex. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. Like the worst swearing I can give this young man is to say he is my begotten son. Takadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu. At it the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakt al ardu and the earth to split asunder. Watan khirrul jibalu hadda and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Anda awli rahmani walada. That they should say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. Allah reacts strongly because words, if they have any meaning, it means what it says. You are attributing to God and animal nature the lower animal functions of sex. Allah reacts. But the unfortunate part is that the Muslims, he doesn't know the Quran. He's sitting on his backside. Allah is being abused, sworn, but he doesn't go to rectify the brother. Rectify him. You're not saying go and bash his head, kick him out of the country. Astaghfirullah. Well, he's welcome. Ahlan wa sahlan. Let him come. Talk to him. Reason with him. He said, look brother, you have misunderstood the whole thing. Son of God is the commonest expression in the Bible. You know, God has got tons by the, sons by the tons in your Bible. Your Bible says, and Adam the son of God. Doesn't it? Ask him, any Christian, how many sons has God got? He said, one. I said, look brother, you don't know your Bible, man. You see, you are ignorant. Wallah, he is ignorant. He says, he's got one son. I said, he's got them by the tons in your book. Tons. So this is what I'm trying to do, to educate the people. Look, this is how to talk and reason with people. Arm yourself. Allah is telling you, Kul hatu burhanakum. Ask him for his proof, for his burhan. In kuntum sadiqin, whatever he can say, come on, you explain from your book now. And you see that there is no explanation. He has to listen to you. At least you have done your duty, you have delivered the message. Next one. Um, Brother Ahmedidad, my name is Yasin Ahmed. Uh, can you tell us the story behind the 19th theory, which is a failure now? This is no time for storytelling. You see, I used to deliver lectures on the subject 19, and I found that some people are making um, wrong use of that. So I have stopped selling my videotapes, my cassettes, as well as the booklet on the subject is all taken off the records. My name is John Zemek, and I work at Kuwait University at the Faculty of Arts. I teach English. Um, I first of all would like to just address the idea that you talked about original sin versus sin actually committed by the person. I myself am a sinner. I stand here a sinner before you and before God. I'm a sinner originally, and I'm a sinner because I, and because of original sin, I have chosen to sin. I have a tendency to do that which is wrong. Now, I'm not sure, but I, I believe that the story is this, f fairly much the same in the Quran and in the, in the uh, uh, Old Testament, that of when Ibrahim took his son onto the mountain to sacrifice his son, to prove to God that his, his obedience to God would be complete. And as Ibrahim took his knife to hold it and to sacrifice his son, God provided a sacrifice, pr provided a substitution for that son so that Ibrahim would not have to kill his son but then he provided the lamb. Now I can tell you that before I committed my life to Jesus Christ that I felt the weight of sin. I felt the weight of those things. I had never killed. I had never, I had never stolen from banks. I had never done some of these more, more uh, uh, heinous type of crimes and yet I felt the weight of sin. And I can also say that as I recognize that Jesus Christ died historically for the sins of the world, and as I recognize that and submitted myself to him, that the weight of sin was taken off. I can also say as of this moment that I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die as I'm talking to you, that I would go to stand before God and God would look at me and he'd say, welcome home, my son. And because of that, I stand here and I and nobody after I die, even if I were a prophet, nobody after I died would have to say peace be upon him because I know 
that, that without a shadow of a doubt, I would stand and I would be totally accepted by God because of the, because of the atoning sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we can talk about semantics. We can talk about, about things. You, you surely are a, a learned man. You, you're learned both in the Quran and in the Bible, the Injil. And I appreciate that. And I consider it an honor to be able to talk to you. And, but, but I'll tell you what. That I've talked to many, many, many Muslims. And I've said, if you were to die at this moment, what, what would happen to you? And in the New Testament, Jesus says, these things are written. It's, it's written in the book of 1 John. And he says, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And this life is in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and brethren, I'm sure, you know, you have, you have discovered that no question was asked. It was his point of view about how he sees things, what he believes, and he came forward to testify, and he testified. Though he had spoken, you know, so many things he's touched about the original sin, and then he felt the weight of sin on him, and now he accepted Christ and the weight is gone off, and all that, all that. That means now this is what he has got is the right thing. But he had, didn't come forward to contradict a single statement I made. I said, sin is not inherited. And your Bible says the same. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You heard that before. A hundred times over. And you see that, read it in Christian literature. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And we all have sinned and we must die. Unless somebody pays for your sins. You know, amazing thing, that the Christian puts a full stop. Where there is no full stop. It's a part of the verse. First phrase, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It continues, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam, he sinned. We are his sons and daughters. You are not going to pay for the iniquity of your father. Neither shall the father pay the iniquity of the son. His children, his children today, yesterday, in San Francisco, 300,000 sodomites. We call them Qawmulut. They gathered in San Francisco in a pilgrimage, Hajj. They're making Hajj in, pilgr in San Francisco. Led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. God Almighty will not ask Adam and say, look at your children, this rubbish. Abominable people, look at them! No. He will not reproach Adam for that. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. You are a good man, your goodness, God will reward you. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. A wicked man, he does any wicked thing, he will have to pay for it. But if the wicked, the way to salvation, in that one verse the whole of theology is given, in your book, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20. But if the wicked, the sinner, will turn, means repent from all the sin that he has committed, and from there on do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is God talking. If the way to salvation was, he should have said, but the wicked, if he believes in my son that is going to come 2,000 years later, he's going to die on the cross for me, it would have been something. He says, no, you repent and do good. God will forgive you your sins. He is not Shylock. He does not want a pound of flesh from you. He doesn't want blood from you. The example you gave about Abraham. What was all the story about? You see, we lost the mark. It's a story. Abraham offering his son. What for? Didn't God know whether he'll pass the test or not? He said God was testing him. What for? Didn't God know whether he'll fail or he will pass? Of course he knew. Then why did he do all this? You see, in Babylonia, in the time of Abraham, human sacrifice was prevalent. People were proud. You can be programmed, brainwashed like zombies to sacrifice your own sons and daughters. They were doing it. And they were getting pleasure in it. The human mind, you can cultivate anything in the mind. Your own child. And so I'm giving my child. What is the sheep or a goat? You know, my own child. I brought him up. He's 16 years old now. Handsome young man or young, beautiful maiden. I says, I sacrifice her for God. Sickness. You can develop that sickness. The human mind is capable of doing all that. This was prevalent. 
God Almighty wants you not to do that. So he enacts a drama for you to learn a lesson. So he says, look, sacrifice your son. In a dream. He says, it's a dream. Again, the thing that you love most. His only son. Ismail, his only son. He says, thy only son. The Christians say it was Isaac. I said, look man, raise your brains. He says, your only son at any time. If he had an only son, it was Ismail. For 13 years, he was the only son and seed of Abraham. Isaac was born 13 years later. And Ismail was accepted by God as the son and seed of Abraham. No less than 12 times in the Bible, he's called. And as for Ishmael, thy son. And as for Ishmael, thy seed. God Almighty, if he recognized Ismail as his son and his seed, for 13 years, he was the only son. Isaac could never have been the only son at any time. So, an actor scene, a drama. I said, look, do this. And he's about to do. God says, no, I was only testing you. What? He is enacting a scene for mankind that I want no sacrifice. No human, no sinner or saint should die for somebody else. For somebody else. You commit murder, you die for your sins. Not an innocent man. This is the law of God. He's telling you, he says, look. God is satisfied with the willingness on your part. What he wants is that you are, show your willingness. That whatever, oh Lord, you tell me, you say pray five times a day, I say, I'll pray five. He said, 50 times, I said, 50 times. He said, one whole month you fast, I said, yes. He said, whole year. If it is from my Lord, I say, fast whole year. Whatever he says, my Lord, I'm prepared to submit to you. To show my willingness, I'm making this sacrifice as a remembrance of that that he's telling you, God is telling you, I want no sacrifice, no flesh and blood of goats and cows are good for you. Why an innocent human being? So the Quran says, wama kataluhu wama saladuhu. They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. And this is what the Bible says. This is the sh shaking part. You see, I said, your Bible says the same. Sir, I said, you see, you read this book in your own language. Your own mother tongue in English. You are an Englishman, I take it. You are an Englishman. Britisher or American. Yeah, you are an American English speaking fellow. Still English. <laughs> See, you're not speaking German at home, you speak English. English is your mother tongue. I said, you English people, English speaking people, you read this book. You Arabs, you read this book in your own mother tongue. They got the Arabic Bible for you. The Urdu speaking fellow reads in Urdu. And the Zulu in Zulu. And the Africans in Africans. Every human being on earth today, 2,000 different languages, they have the Bible for them in their own mother tongue. And each and every one of these group, they understand, misunderstand what they're reading. Amazing. It's an amazing thing. You know, we can all, as I said at the beginning, we can all be programmed into anything. We can all behave like zombies, with donkeys with blinkers on. All! I said all, I'm not pointing a finger at the Christian. All. Whether Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jew, atheist, anybody, everybody can be programmed, brainwashed into anything. So... I said, now you read this book in your own mother tongue and you understand the exact opposite of what you're reading. Exact opposite. Not just misunderstanding. Exact opposite. If you are told in the Holy Bible, thou shalt not commit adultery, you understand that thou shalt commit adultery. So act! Who do you take this for? Zombies? I said, look, I prove it to you. You read the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verse 36. It says, and Jesus returned to that upper room where they had the last supper. The Christian will understand this better than the Muslim because they know the whole background to what I'm talking. After his alleged crucifixion, he goes to that upper room where they had the last supper. And he goes in and he says, Shalom Alaikum in Hebrew. Same as Salam Alaikum in Arabic. When he said, Peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. They thought. That's the reason. They thought he was a spook. The ghost. So they are terrified. People are terrified of ghosts and spooks. We all are. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. They are thinking he's come back from the dead. He was dead and he's resurrected. He's come back. So he says, Unzuru ila yadayya wadijalayya. He says, Behold my hands and my feet. Inni ana huwa. That it is I myself. Hussuni wanzuru. He says, Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him. I'm reading. And they believed not for joy. Means they were overjoyed. Then it's an anticlimax. They thought the man is dead and buried, stinking in his grave. 
But that man is here alive and we feel him. He is the same Jesus. So it says, and they believe not for joy. And wondered, what happened man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, Have you got here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very side to prove what? There is a ghost, is a spirit, is a spook. Come on, come on, tell me. No, I'm the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of before? That's what he's telling you. What are you? And the whole Christian world, in every language of the world, they say he's a spirit. He said a spirit has no flesh and bones. If I got flesh and bones, in your language, you Arabs, I'm asking you, the Arabs. I said, look, if I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? You said yes. To the Englishman, I said, if I said, because I have flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? The Englishman says yes. The Africaner says yes. The Zulu says yes. But now his salvation depends upon that. So he hears and he doesn't hear. This is what happens. He's hearing, but he won't accept. Because that's easy way. It's an easy way. Like Swagat was saying. You see, so you Muslims, get the tape. Get the tape. If you haven't got it, get the tape. It'll be history. Swagat is history. He said, you Muslims, you don't drink. You know why you don't drink? Because you are afraid. They'll cut your toes. They'll cut your nose. Huh? They'll cut your thumb. And that's what he said. That's the reason. You know, you're afraid. That somebody will cut your nose. They'll cut your toes. Is that the reason? That's what he said. But he says, we Christians, that there is no explanation. He has to listen to you. At least you have done your duty. You have delivered the message. Next one. Um, Brother Ahmedidad, my name is Yasin Ahmed. Uh, can you tell us the story behind the 19th theory, which is a failure now? This is no time for storytelling. You see, I used to deliver lectures on the subject 19, and I found that some people are making um, wrong use of that. So I have stopped selling my videotapes, my cassettes, as well as the booklet, and the subject is all taken off the records. My name is John Zemek, and I work at Kuwait University at the Faculty of Arts. I teach English. Um, I first of all would like to just address the idea that you talked about original sin versus sin actually committed by the person. I myself am a sinner. I stand here a sinner before you and before God. I'm a sinner originally, and I'm a sinner because I, and because of original sin, I have chosen to sin. I have a tendency to do that which is wrong. Now, I'm not sure, but I, I believe that the story is this f fairly much the same in the Quran and in the, in the uh, uh, Old Testament, that of when Ibrahim took his son onto the mountain to sacrifice his son, to prove to God that his, his obedience to God would be complete. And as Ibrahim took his knife to hold it and to sacrifice his son, God provided a sacrifice, pro provided a substitution for that son so that Ibrahim would not have to kill his son but then he provided the lamb. Now I can tell you that before I committed my life to Jesus Christ that I felt the weight of sin. I felt the weight of those things. I had never killed. I had never, I had never stolen from banks. I had never done some of these more, more uh, uh, heinous type of crimes and yet I felt the weight of sin. And I can also say that as I recognize that Jesus Christ died historically for the sins of the world, and as I recognize that and submitted myself to him, that the weight of sin was taken off. I can also say as of this moment that I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I were to die as I'm talking to you, that I would go to stand before God and God would look at me and he'd say, welcome home, my son. And because of that, I stand here and I and nobody after I die, even if I were a prophet, nobody after I died would have to say, peace be upon him. Because I know 
that, that without a shadow of a doubt, I would stand and I would be totally accepted by God because of the, because of the atoning sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we can talk about semantics. We can talk about, about things. You, you surely are a, a learned man. You, you're learned both in the Quran and in the Bible, the Injil, and I appreciate that. And I consider it an honor to be able to talk to you. And, but, but I'll tell you what that I've talked to many, many, many Muslims and I've said, if you were to die at this moment, what, what would happen to you? And in the New Testament, Jesus says, these things are written. It's, it's written in the book of 1 John. And he says, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And this life is in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and brethren, I'm sure... You know, you have, you have discovered that no question was asked. It was his point of view about how he sees things, what he believes, and he came forward to testify, and he testified. Though he had spoken, you know, so many things he's touched about the original sin, and then he felt the weight of sin on him, and now he accepted Christ and the weight is gone off, and all that, all that. That means now this is what he has got is the right thing. But he has, didn't come forward to contradict the single statement I made. I said sin is not inherited. And your Bible says the same. The soul that sinneth it shall die. You heard that before. A hundred times over. And you see that, read it in Christian literature. The soul that sinneth it shall die. And we all have sinned and we must die unless somebody pays for your sins. You know, amazing thing, that the Christian puts a full stop, where there's no full stop. It's a part of the verse, first phrase, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It continues, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam, he sinned. We are his sons and daughters. You are not going to pay for the iniquity of your father. Neither shall the father pay the iniquity of the son. His children, his children today, yesterday, in San Francisco, 300,000 sodomites. We call them Khamilut. They gathered in San Francisco in a pilgrimage, Hajj. They're making Hajj in, in San Francisco. Led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. God Almighty will not ask Adam, say, look at your children, this rubbish. Abominable people, look at them. No. He will not reproach Adam for that. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. You are a good man. Your goodness, God will reward you. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. A wicked man, he does any wicked thing, he will have to pay for it. But if the wicked, the way to salvation, in that one verse the whole of theology is given. In your book, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20. But if the wicked, the sinner, will turn, means repent from all the sin that he has committed, and from there on do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is God talking. If the way to salvation was, he should have said, but the wicked, if he believes in my son that is going to come 2,000 years later, he's going to die on the cross for me, it would have been something. He says, no, you repent and do good, God will forgive you your sins. He is not Shylock. He does not want a pound of flesh from you. He doesn't want blood from you. The example you gave about Abraham. What was all the story about? You see, we lost the mark. It's a story. Abraham offering his son. What for? Didn't God know whether he'll pass the test or not? He said God was testing him. What for? Didn't God know whether he'll fail or he will pass? Of course he knew. Then why did he do all this? You see... In Babylonia, in the time of Abraham, human sacrifice was prevalent. People were proud. You can be programmed, brainwashed like zombies to sacrifice your own sons and daughters. They were doing it. And they were getting pleasure in it. The human mind, you can cultivate anything in the mind. Your own child. And so I'm giving my child. What is the sheep or a goat? You know, my own child. I brought him up. He's 16 years old now. Handsome young man or young beautiful maiden. I says, I sacrifice her for God. Sickness, you can develop that sickness. The human mind is capable of doing all that. This was prevalent. God Almighty wants you not to do that. 
So he enacts a drama for you to learn a lesson. So he says, look, sacrifice your son in a dream. He says, it's a dream. Again, the thing that you love most, his only son, Ismail, his only son. He says, thy only son. The Christians say it was Isaac. I said, look, man, where is your brains? He says, your only son at any time. If he had an only son, it was Ismail. For 13 years, he was the only son and seed of Abraham. Isaac was born 13 years later. And Ismail was accepted by God as the son and seed of Abraham. No less than 12 times in the Bible, he's called, and as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed. God Almighty, if he recognized Ismail as his son and his seed, for 13 years, he was the only son. Isaac could never have been the only son at any time. So, I like to see him. The drama. I said, look, do this. And he's about to do. God says, no, I was only testing you. What? He is enacting a scene for mankind that I want no sacrifice. No human, no sinner or saint should die for somebody else. For somebody else. You commit murder, you die for your sins. Hmm? Not an innocent man. This is the law of God. He's telling you, he says, look. God is satisfied with the willingness on your part. What he wants is that you are, show your willingness. That whatever, oh Lord, you tell me, you say pray five times a day, I say, I'll pray five. He said, 50 times, I say, 50 times. He said, one whole month you fast, I say, yes. He said, whole year. If it is from my Lord, I say, fast whole year. Whatever he says, my Lord, I'm prepared to submit to you. To show my willingness, I'm making this sacrifice as a remembrance of that. That he is telling you, God is telling you, I want no sacrifice, no flesh and blood of goats and cows are good for you. Why an innocent human being? So the Quran says, Wama kataluhu wama salabu. They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. And this is what the Bible says. This is the sh shaking part. You see, I said, your Bible says the same. Sir, I said, you see, you read this book in your own language. Your own mother tongue in English. You are an Englishman, I take it. You are an Englishman, Britisher, or American. Yeah, you are an American English speaking fellow. Still English. <laughs> See, you are not speaking German at home, you speak English. English is your mother tongue. I said, you English people, English speaking people, you read this book. You Arabs, you read this book in your own mother tongue. They got the Arabic Bible for you. The Urdu speaking fellow reads in Urdu. And the Zulu in Zulu. And the African and Africans. Every human being on earth today, 2,000 different languages, they have the Bible for them in their own mother tongue. And each and every one of these group, they understand, misunderstand what they're reading. Amazing. It's an amazing thing. You know, we can all, as I said at the beginning, we can all be programmed into anything. We can all behave like zombies, with donkeys with blinkers on. All! I said all. I'm not pointing a finger at the Christian. All. Whether Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jew, atheist, anybody, everybody can be programmed, brainwashed into anything. So... I said, now you read this book in your own mother tongue, and you understand the exact opposite of what you're reading. Exact opposite. Not just misunderstanding. Exact opposite. If you are told in the Holy Bible, thou shalt not commit adultery, you understand that thou shalt commit adultery. So act! What do you take us for, zombies? I said, look, I prove it to you. You read the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verse 36. It says, and Jesus returned to that upper room where they had the Last Supper. The Christian will understand this better than the Muslim because they know the whole background to what I'm talking. After his alleged crucifixion, he goes to that upper room where they had the Last Supper. And he goes in and he says, Shalom Alaikum in Hebrew. Same as Salam Alaikum in Arabic. When he said, Peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. They thought. That's the reason. They thought he was a spook. The ghost. So they are terrified. People are terrified of ghosts and spooks. We all are. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. They are thinking he's come back from the dead. He was dead and he's resurrected. He's come back. So he says, Unzuru ila yadayya wa He says, Behold my hands and my feet. Inni ana huwa. That it is I myself. Hussuni wan zuru. He says, Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him. I'm reading. And they believed not for joy. Means they were overjoyed. Then it's an anticlimax. They thought the man is dead and buried, stinking in his grave. But that man is here alive and we feel him. He is the same Jesus. 
So it says, and they believed not for joy, and wondered, what happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, Aindakum hahuna ta'am, have you got here anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very sight to prove what? That is a ghost, is a spirit, is a spook. Come on, come on, tell me. No, I'm the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? That's what he's telling you. What are you? And the whole Christian world, in every language of the world, they say he's a spirit. He said a spirit has no flesh and bones. If I got flesh and bones, in your language, you Arabs, I'm asking you, the Arabs. I said, look, if I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? You said yes. To the Englishman, I said, if I said, because I have flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? The Englishman says yes, the Afrikaner says yes, the Zulu says yes, but now his salvation depends upon that. So he hears and he doesn't hear. This is what happens. He is hearing, but he won't accept. Because that's easy way. It's an easy way, like Swagat was saying. You see, so you Muslims, get the tape. Get the tape. If you haven't got it, get the tape. It'll be history. Swagat is history. He said, you Muslims, you don't drink. You know why you don't drink? Because you are afraid. They'll cut your toes. They'll cut your nose. Huh? They'll cut your thumb. And that's what he said. That's the reason. You know, you're afraid. That somebody will cut your nose. They'll cut your toes. Is that the reason? That's what he said. But he says, we Christians, we, we are born again. Same spirit. Same spirit. That my, the Reverend Marvin Gorman had, that Jim Baker had, that Jimmy Swaggart had. Each and everyone is boasting that we have the spirit of God in us. The spirit is in us and we don't get tempted anymore. The liar, the liar. He said, he is not tempted anymore. You remember? You see the tape at the beginning? He said, you know, I had a chat with Mr. Didat. Hmm, very nice fellow, Didat. And we were chatting and he said, you know, in Islam we can have four wives. So I corrected him, no, I said up to four. So he said he corrected me because the camera is not on me, so you don't see me. He said he corrected me up to four. But he says in Christianity we are all allowed only one. So I had to choose the best at the first shot. Right? See the tape. He had to choose the best at the first shot, he says. And now we found that the best was not good enough for him. <laughs> Twice a week he needed a prostitute to satisfy his lust. And another one has come forward with the same thing. Mar Reverend Marvin Gorman, Reverend Marvin Gorman, born again Christian, same, caught in adultery. Jim Becker, a sodomite and an adulterer. Jimmy Swaggart, the each and every one of them, by the grace of God, they are falling. The lies that they are uttering, lies. The guy says he's not tempted. I knew he's lying. Because Awan Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that shaitan courses through the body of man like the blood. Shaitan, evil inclinations, temptations are there in every fiber of man. So somebody asked him, what about you? Look, they were open. He said, what about you, O Muhammad? Yes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about you? He says, me too, but mine is under control. The guy who says he's not tempted, he is the devil incarnate, he is the liar of the highest order. The guy who says he's not tempted. Shaitan courses through the body of man like the blood. Anybody, everybody. He said, no, I'm not tempted anymore, beware of him. Keep him at arm's length. Keep him away from your wives and daughters. Otherwise, they'll end up with swaggers and the garments and the bakers. So, these are all claims. Come forward with the fact, he says, look man, you have misunderstood my Bible, tell me. He said, look Mr. D, that you don't understand English. Tell me. Tell me. I want to listen to you. Because maybe in English when a man said a spirit has no flesh and bones, maybe it means a spirit has flesh and bones. Tell me. I want to hear. We have overused this heart. There was a question from our sister, or one of our sisters. What does this man say, or what do we actually want? Whom do we contact about such matters? By the grace of Allah, some of our brothers in Kuwait are organizing a forum for the missionary activities. We want women, young men, scholars, everybody enter the field of Dawa work. Inshallah, in due course of time, you will be informed of their activities. I am not entitled to declare their name now. 
Until such time, I request you to contact International Islamic Charitable Foundation for your inquiries. With this, Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'u al-lalim. Rabbana ufir lana dhunubana wa khatayana innaka anta al-lufuru al-rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil lizati amma yasifun salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. With this, we end this program.